This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Would it surprise you if I told you that I'm dressed for worship? What about now? Do you think that it even matters? Do you think that it matters to God? That's what we want to talk about today, dressing ourselves appropriately, presenting ourselves appropriately as we come together on the first day of the week to worship the God of the universe. You probably wouldn't be surprised if someone said to you that reverence in modern day religion isn't what it used to be. Casual is certainly the way of the day in our country. When the denominational preacher Rick Warren wrote his popular book, The Purpose Driven Life, he went out and surveyed the community to find out what they wanted in a church. And one of the things that he determined from these surveys is that people did not like to dress up. They prefer casual, informal meetings. And so he built his church around the things that he learned. Now, unfortunately, some congregations of the Lord's Church have studied his book and have followed his principles. But you know, he was right that people don't seem to like to dress up. They, they find dressing down to be very appealing. In fact, there seems to be almost an infatuation with being able to wear jeans to church. There's a website that I found while surfing the internet. And you can go to this website and look at different churches in different states, and they will answer the question, can I wear jeans to church? The reason for this lesson is that we're very troubled about the emphasis on the casual and on personal comfort to the neglect of being concerned about what God really wants. I want to begin this lesson in Psalm 89 and verse 7. The Bible says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around Him. The word feared is from the Hebrew word aratz. Definition number one is to tremble, dread, fear, oppress, prevail, break, be terrified, cause to tremble. Another one of the definitions says to regard or treat with awe, regard or treat as awful. God is to be feared. We are to tremble. We are to regard Him with awe. But then the text says that He is to be held in reverence. Now this is from the Hebrew word yare. It means to fear, revere, be afraid. Another one of the definitions says to fear, reverence, honor, or respect. In the assembly of the saints, we should have a trembling, a fear, an awe as we come into the presence of God. It makes me think about Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5. As Moses approaches the burning bush, God stops him and says, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. That is, you're going to have to behave differently. You're going to have to dress differently as you come into the presence of God. It also makes me think about Exodus chapter 19. As the children of Israel had come up out of the land of Egypt, Verse number 9, the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and believe forever. Now listen to verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people, and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. But you see, before the Lord came down in the sight of the people, they were to be sanctified and wash their clothes. Something special had to take place. You see, this wasn't ordinary behavior. God was going to come into their presence. I also think about Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10, where the Bible speaks about the 24 elders falling down before the throne of the Lord and casting their crowns before Him and saying, You are worthy, O Lord to receive glory and honor and power. Friends, when I read in the Bible about people coming into the presence of God and the respect and the honor expressed to Him, I think that we've fallen down on the job. 
Many times we have not treated God as something special, as someone special, one who is to be feared and one who brings awe, but we've treated him as ordinary. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the subject of, of reverence, particularly as it relates to our clothing, how we dress when we come to worship. I want to make four points as we go through this material. Number one, I want to talk about our clothing as it communicates something to God, and our clothing does communicate something to God. Number two, I want us to address the point that our clothing communicates something to others. Number three, our clothing communicates something to us. And then finally, I want to talk about some objections that are made to dressing up for worship. Point number one, let's consider the fact that our clothing communicates something to God. Friends, our clothing matters to God. If our clothing did not matter to God, then why did God tell Moses to take his shoes off? If clothing does not matter to God, then why did God tell Moses, before I come into the presence of the people, have them wash their clothes? And suppose this, suppose one of the children of Israel had said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to wash my clothes. My clothes are more comfortable after I've been wearing them for a few days, and besides that, washing them would be inconvenient. Friends, if one of the Israelites had done that, I want to suggest to you that he would have communicated to God that he was not worthy. He would have communicated that his own comfort and convenience was more important to him than God. And we have to be careful that we don't communicate that today. In Exodus chapter 39 and Leviticus chapter 16, we have a description of the priest garments. And tremendous effort went into preparing the high priest before he went into the presence of God. I would ask this, why did God give such minute details if clothing really doesn't matter? You know, there's also a very interesting passage in 1 Chronicles 15. This is after the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines and the children of Israel had gone to bring it home again. But you remember what happened. You know the story of Uzzah. He touched the ark, and, and so the ark gets left at the house of Obed-Edom for three months. And so finally, David tries again to get the Ark of the Covenant. Now listen to the text. This is 1 Chronicles 15, 25. So David, the elders of Israel, and the captains over thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And so it was when God helped the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bulls and seven rams. Now listen to verse 27. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. Now friends, why is that verse there? Why is the Lord telling us what David was wearing? Well, apparently this was special clothing. This was something out of the ordinary. David had clothed himself in a special way because of what they were doing. They were going to retrieve the ark of God. And the ark is frequently spoken of in the Bible as God dwelling between the cherubim. And they were going into the presence of God. Now, was there a verse that stated that when you go to retrieve the ark of the covenant that you have to dress in a special way? No, I'm not aware of a verse like that. Now, there was special clothing that the priest were to wear when engaging in worship, but I can only surmise that David dressed this way because of the principle of reverence. He was going to get the ark of God. He would not dare do it without showing proper respect. And I want to suggest to you that David dressing this way supports the point that we're making, and that is the clothing that we wear communicates something to God. And David wanted to be as reverent and as respectful as he possibly could be. Now, somebody might argue, well, all of these passages are from the Old Testament. We live under the New Testament. You need to show me something from the New Testament that says that God cares about how we dress when we worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there is a fascinating discussion there that relates to women wearing veils. Now, the Corinthian men were taught to worship with their heads uncovered, that is, not wearing a veil. The Corinthian women were taught 
to wear veils when they worshiped because to do otherwise would be to violate local and current customs in Corinth. Now, we'll discuss the reasons why in a minute, but for now, let's simply acknowledge that God cared about how they clothed themselves in worship. It communicated something that mattered to Him. Now, many people today argue that God does not care how we clothe ourselves in worship. It's, it's only the heart that matters. What if someone in Corinth had argued that? What if someone said to the Apostle Paul, Paul, we don't want to hear about this veil stuff. You know, it's only the heart that matters. God doesn't care about what we wear or we don't wear in worship. What might Paul have said to that person? And you know what's particularly interesting is that there is no passage of Scripture. There, there was nothing previously written that demanded women in Corinth to wear a veil. The thing that made it mandatory was local custom. For a woman in Corinth to, to not wear her veil was rebellious. It was to reject her subordination to the man. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that God expects us to examine local customs and to conduct ourselves in a manner that exalts Him. Now, does that apply to the way we dress? Yes, of course it does. He told the people in Corinth that He cares about the way they dress in worship because it has implications about them and about their hearts. Now, does this principle still apply today? Of course it does. Now, in our society, Wearing a veil or not wearing a veil in worship doesn't communicate anything. But the way we dress still does communicate. It communicates reverence or a lack of it. Our clothing communicates something to God. Okay, point number two. Not only does our clothing communicate something to God, but our clothing communicates something to other people. In the book of Esther, when the decree was made that the Jews were going to be killed, Mordecai changed his clothes. And Esther chapter 4 and verse 1 says that he put on sackcloth and ashes. Now, why did he do that? Well, because he was grieving. And when Esther heard about it, she sent him a change of clothing. You see, his clothing communicated something to other people. Now, I want to go back and consider 1 Corinthians 11 again. God knew that what we wear or, or don't wear communicates something to others. If a man in Corinth were to wear a veil, that communicated something inappropriate to other people. If a woman in Corinth were not to wear a veil, that communicated something negative, a, a lack of respect, rebellion even. Now, with that knowledge, the Apostle Paul said, dress so as to communicate the proper message. For the women, that meant wear a veil. Now, What's particularly interesting is, is there, there weren't any passages that specifically said that they had to wear a veil. Neither was there a universal requirement for the church that said women had to wear a veil. In fact, 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen 16 says, But if anyone seems to be contentious, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. Then why were they required to dress that way? Friends, it's because of what it communicated in that society. The way we dress communicates something to other people, and God expects us to be conscious of that. So what about in our society? Does the way that we dress in our society communicate anything? Well, we know that it does. You know, when we go to a wedding or a funeral, we want to communicate respect, and so we will wear a shirt or, or a tie, maybe even, maybe even a coat. If we're going to meet with a, a dignitary or a governor, we will put on a suit. Why? Because we understand that the way that we dress communicates something to other people. We understand that, you know, if I showed up to meet the President of the United States in tennis shoes and a t-shirt, I understand that that would communicate something insulting. And it's appropriate that we recognize this because I learned from 1 Corinthians 11 that God expects Christians to be aware of the society around us and the customs around us and to behave accordingly. You know, if I lived in a society where wearing a red shirt communicated disdain, I certainly would not wear a red shirt to worship. Well, that, that's not the custom in the world today, certainly not where I live. Well, what is the custom today? Now, we're talking about dressing reverently, and we've already observed that God expects us to communicate right things by the way we dress. How would one dress in our society so as to communicate reverence? 
Well, I guess the only way we're going to know the answer to that question is by considering society. There's a man by the name of John T. Malloy. He's the author of the book, Dress for Success. And while writing his book, he did some very interesting experiments. And one of these experiments, he walked around the Port Authority bus terminal and Grand Central Station in New York City. And what he did was stop people and he would say to them that he was terribly embarrassed, but he had left his wallet at home and he needed 75 cents to get home. And he did this for two hours during rush hour. During the first hour, he wore a suit, but no tie. For the second hour, he wore the same suit, but he added a necktie. In the first hour, he made $7.23, but in the second hour, with his tie on, he made $26, and one man even gave him some extra money to buy a newspaper. Now, why did he make nearly four times as much when he put his tie on? Well, this is what he said. He said the tie is a symbol of respectability and responsibility. It communicates, there's our word, it communicates to other people who you are or reinforces or detracts from their conception of who you should be. Now, after conducting literally thousands of studies and experiments over a period of years, Mr. Malloy concludes that what a person wears is directly related to the success that he will have in life. Now, he's writing from a, a business perspective, but the point is our clothes do say something about us. One man wrote this. He said, they are our clothes. They openly reveal your attitudes toward yourself, self-esteem, toward others, relationships, toward work, its importance, and toward your God, reverence or lack of reverence toward Him. Immodest clothing is a dead giveaway of a person with loose morals, he said. What you wear indicates the importance you attached to that which you are doing. Now here's another article. Again, it relates to the secular world, but once again, it makes the point that what we wear communicates something to other people. Now this article is from the Cincinnati Inquirer. It's entitled, Got a Job Interview? Then Ditch the Flip-Flops. Joseph Rosenfeld, an image consultant based in San Jose, California, said this. He said, there's something that's definitely happening with the younger generation now. There's a lot of accept me now, accept me for who and what I am, and give me whatever I want right now. Jennifer Loyless said, we've had applicants come in with bare midriffs or flip-flops. This does not give us the impression that they respect the work that we do. And the article goes on to say, grads should never delude themselves into thinking that grades trump attitude. Once you learn the company's dress code, she says, dress one step above it. Now, friends, this is very interesting to me because here are people in the secular world who are saying that this very casual dress communicates something to them about a lack of respect. And it's very interesting that they interpret this as you accept me as I am, as, as that type of an attitude. And it's fascinating that they mention specifically flip-flops as a part of this disrespectful attitude. And these are people in the world. You know, as I've traveled around to different congregations, when I go into a, a worship service, the way that people are dressed immediately communicates something to me about their attitudes. It says something to me about their elders. In the congregation where I grew up, whenever we would travel, we had a dress code. And it was more than just stating that our clothing had to be modest, but it said that the boys had to wear nice shirts and slacks and the girls had to wear skirts or dresses. And frequently when we were out in public, maybe we'd gone to a youth rally and on our way home we would stop to eat and people would see us and they would go to the youth director and they would compliment him for our clothing. You see, it sent a message to people about our youth group, and it was a good message. You know, the Bible sustains the fact that what goes on on the outside reveals what is on the inside. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Now, what does that mean? It means that the things that go on on the outside are a revelation of the inside of the heart. Matthew 12, 35 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, 
and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Now again, what goes on on the outside communicates something about the inside. 1 Timothy 2.10 says that women are to dress like women who are professing godliness. That is, if in your heart you desire to be godly, then dress like it. You know, my dress, my clothing might say, I respect. My clothing might say, I don't care. My clothing might say, I'm lazy. My clothing might say, I'm rebellious. My clothing might say a host of other things, but my clothing communicates something. And incidentally, this is the reason that I discourage Christians from wearing nose rings and body art. Not because there's a verse in the Bible that specifically says not to do this, but because these things communicate something to other people, and they communicate a message that the world generally interprets as something that I really don't want as a Christian. Number three, let us consider that not only does our clothing communicate something to God, not only does our clothing communicate something to others, but our clothing communicates something to us. Now, you might think this is a very strange point, but you know, the way that I dress does affect me. It affects my mindset. Again, John T. Malloy found that offices that adopted dress codes experienced more punctuality, productivity, and initiative from employees. Now, why is that? I think it's because the way that we dress affects our mindsets. Somebody was telling me a while back about some offices that used to have casual Fridays, but they had stopped doing that. And the reason this person says, it, it was very interesting. They said that when they had what they referred to as sloppy day, that people's work was also sloppy. And so I got to wondering if that was accurate. And so I did a search on the internet and I found an article at careerknowhows.com. It was entitled Casual Fridays on the Way Out. I want you to listen to this excerpt. It's talking about casual Fridays. It says casual dress led to careless dress and carefree attitudes. Such negligence is not a good business practice and did not go unnoticed or without consequences. As a result, a growing number of companies are revamping their dress codes entirely. The pendulum is swinging back to more formal and traditional workplace attire. Dress down day is being replaced with dress up day and formal Friday is replacing casual Friday. I find it absolutely fascinating that the secular world has discovered that casual dress led to carefree attitudes. Now, what's the point of all of this? The point is the way we dress affects us. And so if the way that I dress matters to God and the way that I dress communicates something to others and it affects me and my mindset, then certainly when I come to worship, I should want to dress in a way that reflects a heart of reverence. The secular world has determined that flip-flops, that's not it. And you know the truth is, we really know what communicates respect. Sometimes people argue that they don't, but we know what communicates respect because we do it when we go to funerals and we do it when we go to weddings. We know. Number four, I wanna talk about some objections that are sometimes made to dressing up for worship services. We're well aware that sometimes people object to getting dressed up to worship God. And so I want to very briefly look at some of these objections. Here's one, number one. Sometimes people will say, it's just too hot. Sometimes men object to wearing a shirt and a tie because they'll say it's, it's too hot. You know, this really seems like a strange objection these days because most church buildings in our country anyway are very comfortably air conditioned. In fact, where I worship, we usually have people complaining that it's too cold and even have blankets to cover themselves during the service, even in the dead of summer. Number two, sometimes people will say, well, we can't dress up because some people can't afford it. You know, the truth is, in our country, I think it would be rare to find a person who truly cannot afford to buy respectful clothing. You know, with the existence of Walmarts and Goodwill stores, clothing that communicates respect can be purchased very affordably. And it's interesting to me how, how it is that oftentimes the people who complain about the cost of a dress shirt 
seem to be able to afford brand name blue jeans. And if someone truly were so poor that they could not afford it, and the church could not, for whatever reason, help them, then they do the best they can, and the Lord would be well pleased with that. Well, someone might even say this. You know, James chapter 2 teaches against dressing up for worship. This is what James chapter 2 actually says. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and you say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? You see, James chapter 2 is not teaching against dressing reverently. It's teaching against showing partiality toward rich people or, or toward anyone. You know, a poor man can dress reverently, but we have a tendency to favor the man in the name brand designer suit over the man wearing a suit that he bought at Goodwill. And that is sinful. That is the mindset that's being condemned by James. You know, I suppose a poor man could have on a suit that's reverent and, and a rich man could have on blue jeans and a t-shirt and we might still violate this principle of James chapter 2 just because we know he's rich. You see, this is not really about clothing, it's about partiality. Okay, objection number three. Somebody says, but you know, dressing reverently is uncomfortable. I certainly don't deny that. But you know, giving to God involves sacrifice. It's not about my personal comfort. If you read Exodus chapter 39 and you read the description of the priest garments, that sounds extremely uncomfortable to me. But that didn't change the fact that God expected them to wear it. You see, their comfort was not the primary consideration. In Malachi chapter 1, the people of Israel had gotten to the point that they counted their service to God a burden. It was inconvenient. It was uncomfortable. They didn't want to do it. In fact, they used the term weariness. It was a weariness to them. But God did not excuse them on the basis of their discomfort or their displeasure. In fact, He was disgusted by their attitude. In Amos chapter 6, the people were consumed with their own comfort, and they had no interest in the service of God, and the description of this people is not a pretty one. Objection number four. Sometimes people will say, clothes don't really matter. It's what's in the heart that counts. Friends, what if the priest had said to the Lord, God, clothes don't matter. It's what's in the heart that counts. Don't you know that? Or what if the people at the base of Mount Sinai had said, we're not going to wash our clothes, Lord. Clothes don't matter as long as our hearts are right. Or what if Moses had said, I'm not going to take my shoes off. It's what's in the heart that counts. You know, we've already observed that our clothes are a reflection of our hearts. You know, occasionally someone wants to go to 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, where the Bible says, For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And they'll say, see, that passage teaches that it doesn't matter what you wear as long as your heart is right. But the point of that passage, if you look at the context, it has nothing to do with how we dress. That passage has to do with physical characteristics over which we have no control. That would include things like height and skin color, etc. The Lord's not concerned with how tall or short I am or whether I'm black or white. He's concerned about my heart. But that doesn't relate to the clothes that I wear. Objection number five. Sometimes people will say, well, the Bible doesn't say that I have to wear dress clothes. There's no passage in the Bible that says that. You know, when I hear people say this sort of thing, it makes me think of the account of the ten lepers in Luke 17. Jesus had healed all ten of them, and only one came back. And Jesus condemned the other nine for not coming back. Now, my question is this. When did Jesus command them to return and give thanks? You go back and search the text because it's not there. Then the question is, then why did he condemn them? If there was no direct command to come back, why did he condemn them for not coming back? And the reason is their failure to come back and say thank you was actually a reflection of their hearts. You know, he shouldn't have had to tell them to come back. If their hearts had been right, they would have done it. 
Now, where is the passage that says, I have to dress reverently when I come to worship God? Well, it's the same principle. Now, I know the Bible doesn't say that you have to wear a dress shirt or you have to wear slacks or even a tie, but in our society, that's what's considered respectable for a man. And if we were going to attend a wedding or a funeral, that's what we would wear. For a woman, it would be a dress or a skirt or nowadays even dress slacks. And so we do that because we understand that it communicates respect. Objection number six. Sometimes people will say, well, people can't dress up for worship because sometimes they come straight from work. Well, that's true. And we're glad that those people are attending and doing the best that they can do. And it's better that they show up at worship in their mechanics uniform or their military camouflage than to not be here at all. And we appreciate those people whose heart is such that they will come to worship even when they haven't had time to go home and change. This is not the type of person we're talking about in this lesson. You know, a person like that is to be admired. Well, objection number seven. Sometimes people will say, well, Sunday nights, they're different. I would ask the question, why? Why do we dress differently on Sunday nights than we do on Sunday mornings? It's just an extension of the Lord's Day worship. Sunday morning and Sunday night, they're not different. Objection number eight. Sometimes people will say, I'm just not going to do it. I would ask, why not? Why would a person just defiantly refuse to dress up to worship the Lord? I really don't have an answer for this one because I don't really understand it. Am I just so stubborn that I refuse? Am I too prideful? I don't know the answer to this one. Friends, when we come together on the Lord's Day to worship, we are coming before the God of the universe. Do I really want to come before Him dressed like this when I know that I can do better? He's the one who, in a word, spoke me into existence. He's the one who sent the ultimate sacrifice for my soul. And He's the one who holds my eternity in His hands. In light of these things, there's no sacrifice too large for me to give. If I would go so far as to present my body as a living sacrifice, Romans 12:1 then wearing a dress shirt and slacks and perhaps even a tie is certainly not too much to ask. We began with Psalm 89, and I want to end with the same chapter. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around Him.